in this slideshow, we're going to take a quick look at collecting data. And I will say that there are many ways to collect data depending on the type. Um, we're going to focus more on collecting data from people. So basically uh, getting information out of people as opposed to collecting data on like the size of carrots at the grocery store, which is a much more straightforward procedure. So when it comes to collecting data from people, we usually do it uh, using a method of survey or questionnaire, which basically mean the same thing. Um, we want to make sure that we're using some sort of decent uh, sampling method, preferably simple random sampling, so that we can avoid bias. And we'll come back to that word bias later. I think most people probably have an intuitive idea of what that means, but we'll come back and, and define it a little bit more specifically. Uh, and I should point out that uh, we can we can conduct surveys in many different ways. And most people, when they think of surveys, they think of the person, you know, standing somewhere with a clipboard asking questions, whether that's like at the mall or on a street. And it is still done that way. Um, however, it's done in many more um, simple ways these days than we're used to. So the ones that you're probably most to are some sort of uh, online surveys where uh, you might get asked some questions by an email. Um, usually you buy stuff from a store and they send you a, a link to, to go fill out a questionnaire, answer some questions and submit some information. Um, you could do telephone ones. Now, many of you maybe aren't as familiar with that. Your parents might be um, just because they're probably the ones that actually answer the phone and, and talk to the people that are on the other end about this stuff. Uh, and some of them, um, sometimes they're very short, sometimes they're very long. It's I usually don't have a big problem with the people that call with like one or two questions. It might be like, who are you planning on voting for in the next election? It's a short question and it's meaningful data. Uh, there's some longer ones out there as well. Uh, Mail-in questionnaires are not very common anymore. Um, however, they are, are still there. Um, there's one, I can't think of the name of the company, uh, but they usually send them out regularly and it's about um, radio and television. They're trying to figure out what kind of, or like what stations you watch, what type of, of music or TV shows you watch or listen to. And they use that to uh, inform broadcasting and advertising. And if you ever get a chance to partake in one of those, do it if you, if you are okay with it, um, because it does mean that your voice is heard in that group and that you're more likely to hear the kind of music you want or see the kinds of ads that you want or the television shows that you want by filling that out if you're part of that survey. Uh, and then uh, even though it's the first one on my list here, one-on-one um, -on -one or group interviews, this is the, again, the clipboard person asking you questions or sometimes, um, and this is actually kind of cool, you, you may be um, called and asked if you want to partake in a kind of a group interview about something. And I've often they pay you for that, which is kind of cool. I've only unfortunately got to do uh, two of those in my life. And both of them I thought were pretty good experiences. Like I actually enjoyed them and I got paid. Uh, one of them I was actually, I think it was probably around seven or eight years old. And I got, um, I was in a bowling league because my parents, that was like, that was like as physical as I was going to get for my ac physical activity and sports. And they, they came to the, the, the people that were trying to conduct the survey came to the bowling thing and signed up some kids to, uh, to do a survey on Jello. And it was uh, basically we had to go somewhere for an hour and eat Jello, and tell them what we thought about the Jello, and they paid us ten dollars. And when I was seven years old in 1982, and they were offering me ten dollars, which was at the time a lot more money than it is now, and to a seven-year-old even more than that. It's like coming and offering some little kid like like offering you a hundred bucks to to spend an hour eating burgers. Uh, it was it was the greatest thing that happened in my life at that point. But anyway, 10 bucks um, to eat Jello for an hour was pretty awesome. And then just tell them what I thought of it. And then I did one just a few years ago and it was, um, I didn't know what the topic was. They kept it private because they didn't want to bias the results until we got there. And it was just basically a round table discussion about um, uh, our thoughts and knowledge about Canada's underground economy, which is essentially like people that do work um, without claiming it, so they don't pay taxes, income tax. So there's a lot of things like contractors who are willing to come, you know, do housework, contracting stuff, but they don't they don't give you a receipt and they don't um, they don't pay taxes for it. 
and it just recently a couple months ago i started seeing commercials about um about that on appearing on television and so they were just asking us you know were you aware of this did you know this what would you think of this and this and it was basically trying to um to come up with good ideas for that advertising campaign and i think i was there for an hour and a half ish and they paid me 50 bucks so that was kind of cool go and talk about something that was semi-interesting um, anyway so if you have a chance to do that please by all means do okay uh collecting the data itself so there's two major kind of categories of data collection and they they do have slightly different results or interpretations depending on how they're they're collected so a primary data you collect primary data when you are the researcher you're the one going and getting the information um, secondary data is when you're getting your information from some other source and in these days that would usually be something like for instance a um, an internet site a whatever for those who have a hard time understanding the difference between these two because some some things are a little bit fuzzy like for instance if i said i wanted you to um, figure out the gas prices of 20 different gas stations in kw um, someone who goes and looks at the board and writes down the number versus someone who goes to the gas station's website and writes down the number um, like that seems like it's the same thing the big the big way to determine if something is really primary data or secondary data is ask yourself if you saw a weird number who would you blame so for instance if i said okay here's a data set and it's giving people's heights in inches and one of the numbers in the data set was 182. well 182 inches is like 15 feet that's that's pretty tall i don't think there's too many 15. now I, i'm guessing that 152 was probably or 172 or whatever was 182 whatever number i said was actually in centimeters and not in inches and if you were the one who collected that data i think you would know that the data was wrong I think you would know, wait a second, I must have written down centimeters there. That couldn't possibly be right. Whereas if I went to a website of um, people's heights on, let's say, for instance, a pro sports team, and one of the answers said 182 inches, I have no idea if, I, I'm pretty sure that's wrong, because I don't know anyone who's 15 feet tall, but I, I don't know how that mistake was made. So that would be secondary data. Uh, likewise, if I saw a gas price that was, I don't know, 35 cents a liter uh if i'm the one who collected the data from the gas stations i would probably say oh i just goofed i wrote down 35 cents a liter it must i, I think it was a dollar 35. whereas if it's on a website did they is that the mistake they made or did they actually have a sale that day like if, if you were the one who collected the data and you were there and it's at 35 cents on the actual sign they were charging people 35 cents a liter you would know that you would remember it um, so that's the big one to d distinguish if something is really primary or secondary. Primary, you collect it directly and you kind of understand whether it's right or wrong and, and you have control over, over what you write down. Secondary data, you just have to take whoever wrote it down their word for it, whether it's a website or something else. Now I should point out if the gas station actually screwed up and wrote down 35 cents on their sign instead of a buck 35, it's it's still wrong but it's actually correct data for you the fact that they screwed up doesn't mean they're not putting that as their, their actual price so that would be their problem not yours you're still a, cor a correct data collector okay so i um, not going to spend too much more time here because this is just um, the idea of collecting secondary data and again secondary data is often something that you would collect from from the internet at this point in your life. You could get it out of a magazine or a newspaper or a book. Um, those are all possibilities. Um, yeah, actually, I'm gonna just stop there and keep going. Question styles. Um, questions can be broken into open-ended and closed-ended questions. By the way, there's like a million different ways of breaking down questions. This is just one of the ways, open and closed-ended. The idea here is, is pretty straightforward. An open-ended question 
um, is usually trying to get a person to give a, a fairly detailed explanation or a fairly detailed uh, answer to a question. So a question like, um, why did you decide you wanted to go to college um, would be a decent open-ended question because there's a lot of possible answers to that and they could often be fairly um, intricate. So that would be something that's open-ended. A closed-ended question is something where there's a relatively limited number of expected results and it's usually something fairly short and easy to write down. So for instance, if I said, how old are you? There are a lot of different answers to that question. I can think of over 100 because you could be one year old or two year old or 105 years old. But there's a lot of answers, but they're, they're still, I, mean, I, I kind of know what I'm expecting and it's something that's short and easy to write down. How many pets do you have? Um, what's your mother's name? What's like, there, there's a whole bunch of closed ended questions like that. They're usually fairly short and they're easy to categorize. Um, Usually, uh, an open-ended question is something, if you're doing it on a computer, where there's a fairly large area to answer your question. Um, so if I asked you, for instance, how do you feel about um, going back to school in August, if I had done that in August, or if I do it in August next year, if you're going back to school, um, that would definitely be a very open-ended question because you could go on and on about things. Now, that doesn't mean that every answer is going to be like long by design. Your answer could be fine. I feel fine. That's a full solution, but I would I would ex be prepared to take a much longer answer. Whereas if I asked you um you know, um do you like ice cream? I'm kind of expecting the answer to be yes, no, or sometimes perhaps depends on flavor, but I, I don't have a lot to, to think about. I, I know what to write down. It's usually very easy to categorize. Okay, so that was an example of an open-ended question that we just looked at. Um, types of closed-ended questions. So the most most common types are gonna be things like information questions where you ask for information, you write down information. Uh, checklist, ranking, and rating. And I, I'm starting to explain these, but there's slides for them individually. So, so let's go here. So information questions, looking for a single answer. So what is your age? 46. Um, what's your hair color? Brown. Do you have a dog? Yes. Like those kinds of things. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there. A checklist question is is usually anything that has the check all that apply. So of the following items, which do you bring to um, to class on a regular basis? Do, do you bring a textbook, pencil, eraser, pen? So you're just checking off all the things that you would bring to class. I, I don't know anyone who brings flashcards anymore. And uh, I put MP3 player, which is severely dating me right now. I should have just put down cell phone and then everyone would put that there. Ironically, if I put cell phone on this list, I think it would be more common than any other item. Okay, then we get to ranking questions, which is usually, you know, which of these is most important to least important. Um, so for those items there, which one, which one of those is most important to you? MP3 player, cell phone, computer, or DVD player? I'm going to go out on a limb and say for most of you, it's a cell phone. For those of you who uh, don't answer that, it's computer. I don't know anyone who puts MP3 or DVD anymore. And then rating questions, not to be confused with ranking questions, which would be um, basically on, on a scale of, like the, the most common ones of these are on a scale of one to 10, where are you for, you know, how much you love math? Are you a, a three, a five, an eight? Where are you? Uh, or a simplified version of that here. So which of these would you rate as your love of math? Love it, hate it, not bad, not crazy about it, etc. One of the most important things I can state about writing questions is make your questions simple, understandable, and specific. So just as an example of that, um, a couple of years ago, 
Um, actually, before I go to that long example, a short one that I got when we were doing this in, in class not long ago, and I, I kind of get questions like this, was um, someone wanted to know about how much fruit people eat. So the question said, how many apples do you eat? Which sounded fairly simple and understandable. What does the number mean? How many apples do you eat? Seven. What, like, how do I define that? Seven a day? I've eaten seven apples in my lifetime. So a, a better question would have been, on average, how many apples do you eat in a week? Or um, something to that effect. But do, you've got to be as specific as possible about it, because otherwise people won't know how to answer the question, or the results could be meaningless. Uh, the longer example I was going to mention is uh, my department head, who uh, has actually taught this course since since we had this discussion, I think it was just, we both had a good laugh over it. She asked her class, um, she wanted to know whether students got their math abilities from their mother or their father. Um, which actually, anytime you ask a question like this, you should also have a category for other because maybe someone lives with an aunt or uncle or their grandparents. Um, in which case they can't answer that question and they, if those are the only two options they can check off, it's very confusing. But she didn't have check boxes. She just just left a space for them to write down. And the question was, who's better at math? Your mother, um, how did she word it? Is your mom or dad better at math? Was the way she worded it. And she expected to, to see dad or mom. She wasn't sure which one was going to be the most dominant. But what turned out to be, like, just think about and guess what the most common answer she got was. The most common answer she received was yes. And she was like, well, what does that even mean? And I said, you didn't ask them whether their mother or father knew more math than them. You asked them, does your mother or father, is your mother or father better at math? And for most of them, their mom or dad is better at math than they are. So they said yes. And it was it was not the information she was looking to uh, collect because the question did leave some ambiguity as to what it actually meant. So a good thing to do is usually when you're writing a survey is to um, ask other people or think about how it could be misinterpreted. It's always a fun game to say how many ways can this be screwed up or messed around with by people reasonably not understanding it. Okay, I think we're going to stop there, and uh, we have one more presentation to go through, uh, which we'll do next time.